Today is March 15, 2014. I'm Richard Litoff and I have the honor and the privilege to interview Robert Fields about his experiences during World War II. Do you remember where you were at when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor? Yes, I was in Fort Wayne, Indiana, working at International Harvester and the body engineering department. And what was your reaction when you heard uh, the attack uh, on Pearl Harbor? How soon were we going to get drafted, probably? Because there was a lot of excitement. I was boarding at a lady's house, a gentleman's house at the time. And, uh, so, there was a lot of questions. And where were you born? In Davis County, Indiana. And near which city? Well, I guess Washington, Indiana. It's as close as I. But uh, uh, the Lagoni was the closest small town. And what's your date of birth? January 20th, 1922. And what took you up to Fort Wayne? Well, I was just out of high school taking some and enrolled for some classes in drafting when my brother called from Fort Wayne who worked at Inter International Harvester. And I don't know the details of my uh, hiring, <clears throat> but he had asked if I would consider working in the engineering department. Well, who would turn down a job like that in 1940 for a high school uh, graduate? The fact that my brother was also uh, probably the lead designer in, the, uh, in that department didn't hurt. So uh, I s said yes and probably within hours was, in my, was on my way to Fort Wayne. Great, great uh, experience. So how long did you work there at International oh, Harvester in Fort Wayne? Hour. It must have been, it was actually, uh, it was before Thanksgiving, uh, well let me start over again. The, uh, It, w it was two weeks bef before graduating that I had had a, an injury that partially paralyzed me, but I had gotten over it very well. And uh, I think by Thanksgiving, I was in Fort Wayne, uh, Indiana, and then it was after Pearl Harbor, December the 7th. I would guess that uh, it was probably February or March of, of the next year that I uh, left for uh, San Diego to work at the Consolidated. So why did you go to Consolidated? What uh, occurred to allow you to go there? That's another kind of a story. Uh, I just, I had, uh, there were ads in the newspapers wanting draftsmen and loftsmen at uh, Consolidated Multi in uh, San Diego, and I just 
went down and talked to the people, and it was hard. I mean, it's uh, a lot of things were pretty fluid. Then. Uh, I uh, was given the money and a ticket to San Diego, and off I went. So. But I didn't stay there very long. One of my experiences was as consolidated. I was assigned a night shift, and I don't believe that I ever completed any single job. Sat around mostly, and I finally figured it out that. It was a case of simple cost plus. The companies would hire anybody they wanted to, it seemed, because how could they fail? They were guaranteed profit of every dollar turned out. So that's when I got a call from my folks here telling me about the Republic plant that was to be built here. But it wasn't ready yet. Uh, so I went to the Farmingdale branch of the company at Republic and so that I could come to Evansville when the plant was ready. I didn't work there probably a matter of a few months when the plant was open here. And I just hopped a bus and came back to Evansville. Going back to a Consolidated, you mentioned that you were on the night shift yes. and there was not much to do. Was it mainly because of a slowdown or there just wasn't that much work yeah. ready uh, yeah. yet? There was more people than there was work to be done. As I said, in my estimation at that time, it didn't matter what you do or what you could do. You just show up and you get a paycheck because they were going to make a profit on it every dollar that they spent with the government's money. That's why I left them. That plus the fact, of course, uh, that Republic was opening a plant, building a plant here in Evansville. So it was a simple matter. Uh, I just said goodbye. I mean, uh, I was told, well, we'll have your you-know-what in the Army. And I said, go ahead. I've got a place to draft anyway, and so I just went to work for the Republic. And when this plant opened, I came back home. And not soon, no sooner than I was home, I was shipped to Detroit, to Detroit, in this tool liaison. Yeah, tell me a little bit about, more about uh, Republic Aviation Farmingdale. Uh, was it similar to what you experienced at uh, Consolidated San Diego, or how was it different it was, at Republic? It was enormously different. In uh, Farmingdale, they had work that to be done, and I could have worked seven days a week if I had wanted to, and did work some seven days. But. Uh, uh, what did they have you do at uh, Republic Farmingdale? Oh, a lot of that was flat pattern work, uh, making flat patterns for uh, off of the drawings. Do you remember and which part it, of the it, aircraft you worked on? Yes, part of the fuselage from station, I think 101 and 5 eighths, about three, I don't know. 36 to 40 inches of the side of the, of the fuselage. It was a size that encased the rubber fuel tanks. 
and uh, so it, it was uh, it was steady. They were charged. They were changing the engine engine mounts forward about eight inches. I never knew why they moved that engine forward, but I suspect it was for balance. So I I was in on that to some extent, but. And I, as I said, I left home. I left there and came back home. Well, what was security like getting in and out of Republic Farmingdale? I couldn't see any security. I mean, there was people just flooding in there every evening. And uh, uh, if there was any, anything special going on, I didn't know. Uh, about how long were you there at uh, Farmingdale? Uh, probably six months. And when you got the job, it was basically just a, a cold call or just you sent a letter just saying, I, I'm yeah. interested? Yes. And then they just said, okay, oh. come? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I didn't, uh, if anybody did any checking on me, I don't know who or what. Just show up and, and, and make an application. Was it easy to find lodging? Uh, uh, was it as crazy as Evansville was during yeah. the build-up? Uh, yes, I found a room at Mrs. Ketchum's in Farmingdale and took the light rail to uh, Farmingdale from, from, to, uh, from the plant. About how long was your commute or how far? Gosh, I don't really remember now. Uh, couldn't have been very far. I know that uh, I had a kind of an interesting trip with a young fellow that, uh, young fellow, that was uh, going to uh, to uh, for, to the plant, and we sat side by side, and I noticed that he kept edging into me, and I said, "Would you like to sit here by the window?" And he said, uh, "Yeah." And he said, "Look at that! It's vast." And I finally figured out this guy was from did downtown New York someplace. Had never seen an open field, I don't think, because at that time, uh, the, the, uh, Long Island had a lot of fairly large farms. And so uh, uh, it would look to him, I think, like he's in the wilderness. Anyway, that's... Well, how about your reaction? You were kind of in the opposite. You came from a smaller farming town, and you go to the big city of San Diego, now New York. Well, but, yeah. What was your impression seeing oh, the big city? Oh, I'm, I've, I was fascinated, too. But I didn't stay in uh, Davis County, Indiana. The folks moved to Evansville when I was only one year old. So I was really raised in Evansville, Indiana, not uh, Davis County. But yeah, I, I, I'm a fan of big, big cities. I enjoy it. Well, well, when you were working at Farmingdale, did you get a chance to go into New York City, Manhattan? Yeah. And what was that like well, at that time? That was one of a uh, couple of occasions. I met a young guy on my age working at the, in the engineering department and uh, kind of trying to think of his name but, the, but he uh, took me around even though there was a gas uh, rationing and uh, Strohzitter, Bob Strohzitter and uh, he took me down to see the uh, French ship 
can't remember the name that has been capsized in New York Harvey, Harbor. We also, with another guy, can't think of his name, but uh, would, uh, was able to get us into some of the nightclubs. Not many, but uh, uh, that was kind of an interesting thing. While you were at Farmingdale, do you remember other things that were being rationed besides gasoline? Sugar, uh, coffee, gasoline, I guess I meant. And did you have to have blackouts I don't at night? I don't remember any blackouts. Uh, now, coastwise, if you're closer, uh, you might have, but... Uh, I don't remember anything of that nature. So what's the reason Republic didn't keep you there at Farmingdale? What was the reason they... Uh... I said I'm going to Evansville, period. And they said, as soon as I got to Evansville, you are now going to Detroit. Because I had had my minimal amount of experience with the detailed system of, at uh, Farmingdale. I did have an advantage. I was uh, 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 pretty well able to follow the uh, aircraft type drawing. So, uh, it worked out very well as far as just doing the job at Detroit. But no, that was that was not my choice. That was uh, Republic's choice to send me. So, what was the purpose for going to Detroit? To follow the tooling that uh, was being manufactured there for the uh, P-47. A very simple type tools required at that time in the aircraft industry. And, uh, so who designed the the tooling? Was it Farmingdale? Farmingdale and, basically, yeah. And then they basically yeah. contracted that out to of Detroit? They made, they made extra sets. They were not the same set of tools at Farmingdale, and that was, but there were duplicates. Mm -hmm. uh, because Farmingdale was not only that, I believe that uh, Curtis Wright were also producing uh, a P-47. So there were actually three sets of tools, but they were on various stages of development. Uh, some of them might have the laser back, the other might have a bubble canopy, for example. Do you remember the firm in Detroit that was making yes, the tooling? Yes, my, my shop, and I only had the one, probably the biggest one, was Heidrich Tool and Die. I don't know how you spell that. H-E-I-D-R-I-C-H, I think. So Heidrich Tool and, and Die. Yeah. And how long were you there, and what were you doing there in Detroit itself? Well, what I was doing was following these tools, in other words, and answering any questions. All of the drawings of changes, for example, would come to me at Heidrich Tool and I. And I was, I was pretty great at this too, but but there had to be some notification uh, to Evansville that this set of dies or that set of dies were ready. Well, they might call me and say, where is this one? We need this one instead of that one. That kind of communication really was the basic uh, part of the job. So approximately how many different tools and dies 
had to be make a complete set to come to Evansville? Well, no, I'm only, only familiar with the section that I had. And I couldn't honestly tell you. It's probably, you might have two or three dies on a single part, a blanket form and uh, so forth. So you're talking about literally hundreds and hundreds. Oh, absolutely, especially if you talk about every one of these guys that were inside the shop. If you add all of those tools with hundreds of uh, tools. But that, they took that, the tool shop took that from the receipt of the drawing to the completed tool and tryout was also another. Part of it. They had to try those dies and fixtures out before uh, I would accept it. So would you yourself actually do the tryout or the testing? No, I did not. Or you shop, looked at their results? The shop would do the testing, would do the uh, tryout of the tools. They had, uh, of course, these guys were experienced in tool and dies for automobiles and for, uh, I, I think some of them were shocked at how flimsy these tools were for making aircraft parts because you don't get away with uh, minor stuff uh, in an automobile panel, for example, hood. It has to be perfect. And, uh, these were to them, were a crude set of tools. So you're saying they're more crude than the automobile tools? It, oh yes, much more crude than the automobile. If you have runs of hundreds of, or thousands of fender brackets for the aircraft industry, I mean, for the automobile tools, you might only make a uh, hundred or less than that. You don't have the long production runs in aircraft or didn't. But at the same time, these uh, uh, aircraft people thought that, that was, these were long runs if they were making a hundred parts or something. You would think that the, but they would want to have a higher quality for aircraft production than they would uh, for automotive. I don't know what you mean by quality. The they design and the manufacture le left nothing to be desired as far as safety is concerned. But you got uh, the automobile people again, if, if you've ever ever been in a plant running metal parts, for example. Uh, an automobile, it's, it's a lot. And aircraft is very smart, small amount at a time. But uh, uh, they didn't, uh, there was just a difference in design of, of parts for aircraft. There was no, no slackening of quality. And how long, approximately, in terms of months, would it take the tool and die shop to make uh, a complete set of tool and dies to send to the uh, you plant? Would take, you would take one individual component. It might not take, oh gosh, it could just run the whole gamut of time. But they were simple tools. They were simple to machine. And uh, they were turned out very quickly. So the Evansville Republic Aviation Plant did not have to wait then too long to get started in That's making correct. parts. That's correct. They could turn them out very fast. Uh, Detroit knew how to do it. And, uh, they might make fun of the type of tools and whatnot that were being made for the P-47, but they knew what they were doing.
So about how long were you up in Detroit then reviewing? I'm going to say about uh, four months. And did you ever have to return again? Because I'm assuming over time they were constantly modifying the P-47 uh, and they would need new yeah, tools I, and eyes. I wasn't so much aware of the uh, modifications. Uh, so after you came back to Evansville from Detroit, what did they have you do at Republic Aviation at Evansville? I was on the floor of, uh, again, liaison work with the foreman and people that were actually doing the work. For example, if they needed a different shape of, uh, of a bucking bar, for example, if it were difficult to get into a place to get to the back side of the river, I would simply take an AVO or a sheet of paper and draw out a new one and take it down to the tool shop and then build it. Uh, you used to see these, I think they were green cards called AVOs, Avoid Verbal Orders. And you could slip them right into the tool shop and follow it and get the tool made. But uh, they did have a, uh, in other words, I, I, there was a, a lot of, uh, work done quickly without much authorization. But again, I think everybody understood you got to get the job done. What did you see as being different in the way the P-47s were manufactured in Farmingdale versus Evansville? I don't know that I could answer that. In other words, uh, Evansville, if you'd ask any one of the uh, top management, uh, well, we're, we're better. Uh, that was a proper attitude in more time. Yeah. But uh, there's no rivalry in a sense that you know, would impede the uh, flow of work. Just, uh, what did you notice that was changing in the way the P-47s were being uh, manufactured and assembled when you first got there versus later on? What were some of the new innovations that they were doing? Uh, well, of course, the, the uh, fin razor, what is it, you razor back change. There was a change in the uh, basic structure that caused, uh, I'm not sure why this was done, but the engine at some point on the aircraft was pulled forward eight inches. And again, I may be repeating myself, I don't know, but uh, I had the impression that there was a problem of balance in the, uh, in the aircraft. Other than that, uh, well, each, well, they were interchangeable, you know, for the most part. Was there a particular department you were in? I know they had many departments at Republic Aviation. Yeah, I guess it would just be the tooling. Tooling? The tooling department. And because you were in tooling, I assume you had an opportunity to move around widely throughout the, the plant. I did. Uh, I guess uh, had you been making a nuisance of yourself, you would, you would probably have been told to get back on the job, but uh, that never happened. How did they uh, encourage people to, you know, to improve uh, the quality, to, to work hard? Was there any incentives or did they have inspirational talks? How did they get the workers to uh, 
do such an outstanding job at Republic? I don't, I don't remember anything of that. I think everybody that I knew tried to do the very best job they could do. But as far as the, the competitive things you might think of between departments, I don't recall anything of that nature. Because Republic Aviation won several of the production Army Navy E awards, how did they present that to the the whole plant I think or the there workers? Probably was a ceremony or two. They call the people in the in the plants right on the floor and make the announcement. Uh, I seem to remember them having done that. Yeah, but that's it. I remember when uh, Delano Roosevelt came and uh, <coughs> riding in the open limousine and uh, the, I think he came up at a loading dock and made a tour of the plant inside and uh, so that uh, created uh, a bit of a stir. Were you able to make uh, good friends there amongst the co-workers? You know, most of those are dead now. I mean, why you'd expect that, of course. Uh, yeah, Evansville had some pretty doggone good uh, craftsmen, I believe. At the time, and, uh, did some of your friends get together after work uh, to do things, and what would you have done at that time? There was, uh, I'm not sure, one or two company wide, I mean, division wide. Uh, oh, I don't know like uh, picnics and things of that nature. But uh, now I guess most of the people that I do there switched over into civilian uh, jobs when the war ended. Did you have fr friends that worked in some of the other manufacturing facilities in Evansville? No, I can't think of any uh, later on maybe, but not at the time. And do you remember what security was like? getting in and out of Republic at that well, time? I think they probably had to open your lunchbox if you had one. Uh, I remember in particular along the 41 they, were, they had parking space for city buses. Row and row of city buses lined up at each shift change that uh, take people into, into the city. Out. This was a plant out there with a cornfield, and uh, it's a, it's amazing how quickly they put that up. So how did you get to work? I had a car by that time. Yeah. Well, and was the the rationing did that limit your ability to oh, yeah. have enough gas well, to get to work? Enough. Yeah, I think an A-card is four gallons of gas. I'm just guessing my memory's not too good about that. But, uh, but in truth, you could get gasoline anywhere. It wasn't a big deal. At least I didn't find it that way. There are all kinds of ways of getting around that. Like how? How would you... Get well, gas without a coupon. Well, you might have, you know, let's say, one of the uh, union stewards might uh, have uh, a few acorns left, 
and uh, so uh, no big deal. So and, they would give you extra cards sure, then? Sure. Some of them were even already signed. It didn't matter. Just reuse them. So what sort of things were there to do on the weekends when you weren't working? <laughs> well, I guess you'd do it one about any young fellow would do it. Uh, if you had a little money in your pocket, you spend it. Uh, What would you like to spend your money on? Now? <laughs> uh, uh, I think I'm past that. I don't know. I, I, I made friends pretty easily then. Uh, for example, at Fort Wayne. Uh, they had a new, couple of new guys come in, both when I did. You know, they were gearing up for a war. This was nothing uh, to be surprised about. But uh, uh, I was invited to uh, Bob Porter's uh, new guy, single. His folks had a farm out, you know, outside of Fort Wayne. Invited me out, you know, for a weekend. And, uh, uh, so, uh, I didn't have any trouble making uh, acquaintances, at least. Well, when you were at Republic uh, Evansville, did you ever get the opportunity to meet some of the test pilots or some no, of the women ferry I pilots? I never did. I never met one of them. Uh, they could come zooming over, uh, and uh, one or two have lost their life out here north of town. No, I, I never met any of them. Did you ever get to see some of the planes fly out on the airport, you know, and do maneuvers, oh, sure. testing? Oh, sure. Yeah. Those, uh, you get to know by the sound of the engine what kind of aircraft it is. If you listen to a P-51 Mustang, you don't mistake that for a 47, or at least I didn't. And, uh, and I, I used to think that the, uh, the 51 had a, a, a really deep snarl in their engines. And, uh, and the old 47 just howled. I mean, it's, uh, it's different. Because one of them was the one of v, V16, and uh, the 47 was an 18 cylinder, two, two rows of nine each. Did you ever hear any um, stories coming back on how well the P-47s performed I, in, I, in the there, there theater? Was, I was. I don't recall any specific ones. But yeah, there were, there were expressions of how well the 47 did. There was a story about a 47 that lost one or two of what they called the jugs, the, the pistons, and supposedly came all the way back from a raid deep in Germany with some of the parts missing out of the engine. Uh, and the, the question is how, how well it could have held together without Draining all the oil off, for example. That's just stories like that. You never know 
what our mouths are made for, uh, uh, pepping people up or not, but I don't know, I think it's probably true. Well, do you remember any funny stories there working at the plant? Did anyone ever play any pranks or... or uh... Yeah, but there's one I wouldn't tell you about. Uh, it uh, wasn't funny in the end. When you hear the name of Rommel, what, what does that... You know, that guy Tell actually you. looked like Erwin Vogel, the, the old desert fox. After the, after, uh, well, he, of course, he came back after the war and worked for Harvester as well. Who is the gentleman? What's his name? Gene Rama. Uh, the, Erwin Rama was his cousin, I don't know how far back, but those two guys, if you took a picture of Irwin Rommel, the general, and Gene Rommel, you wouldn't have too many doubts about the fact that these guys were related. And Gene Rommel was really a nice guy. It wasn't, he got irritated maybe, but what the hell. So what did he do uh, here in Evansville? Same, same thing. Oh, well, no, he was Evansville. He was Evansville when I knew him all the time, both for uh, uh, the P-47 and, uh, and, uh, and Evansville. He was, he was always here. He worked at Republic Aviation? Yes, yeah, I did. So when did he uh, join uh, Republic Aviation? Remember what really year? I don't really know. He was here when I came. Uh, so he probably was hired in Farmingdale and then moved to Evansville, I'm guessing. So did Republic Aviation ever do a background check on him and know that he was related to... Well, I'm sure they did, but... but uh, I don't think anybody would ever question his... Uh, so was he born in Germany? I don't know that. Hmm. I don't know that. I know that Gene had, after the war, bad, very bad back problems. That was just simply uh, an influence for the rest balance of his life. How did you get uh, kicked out of the tool room at Republic Aviation Evansville? Uh, I was, first of all, a 21 or 20 or 21 year old snot nose, and I was sent to Gene Rommel's office in the tool room downstairs because they were having trouble locating a dimension. And so I went down as I was told to do, and uh, had little trouble finding the dimension, which irritated Gene Rommel no end, that his tool makers, or he, I don't know this for sure, but he probably couldn't have found it himself. So he was invited, I was invited to go back and stay out for a while. Uh, uh, but. To his credit, my boss, the guy in the center of that photograph, called him back in my presence and told him not to do that anymore. And that's the end of that story. Women's labor movement at that time. Because a lot of those ladies knew uh, being able to get a paycheck of their own. And that was quite a thing. Because a lot of these girls on a high school or whatever had never had any money of their own, virtually. 
There's one story, and this has been told, it's not unique to Amazon, that when uh, the war was about over, uh, some of the ladies, one of the ladies said, oh heck, we only had two or three more payments on the farm or whatever, not realizing what she's saying really is, I hope the war keeps on going until we get our farm paid off. And that was not very well. Didn't go down very well. So you worked at Republic Aviation Evansville until the end of the, end war. Of the war. What do you remember when uh, the first surrender by Germany? Was there any sort of celebration or what was the reaction by the workers at Republic Aviation? Oh, I think everybody was ecstatic about that. I mean, well, I think really, I think Japan surrendered first, did they not? No. Was the other way? Yeah. Okay. So when Japan uh, surrendered, was there a, another celebration or what was the reaction by the workers that the War was finally well, over. Well, they probably stopped everything for a while. I guarantee that. Uh, it didn't, uh, well, they, everybody knew the war was over, period. They just had to clean up the mess. Uh, so, uh, so what did you do at Republic Aviation when it started to shut down? What, what I started things? to look for another job. <laughs> no, I, uh, I have so been so very fortunate. I don't think I've ever been without a job. Looking back on your experiences during World War II, how did it uh, later on change your life? Well, I think it changed everybody's life, was that's concerned. But. Uh, That's a, that's a hard question to answer. You can't not be changed, but in my case, I think the shift was was pretty smooth. Dumb choices sometimes, but. Uh, I don't know. What would you tell the younger generations of today well, why it's important getting, to remember getting, World War II? You're getting me into deep trouble now because, because I'd be take, I, I don't want to start preaching. I've probably done too much of that. Uh, well, I want to thank you for sharing your experiences of World War II. It's been an You're honor welcome. and a pleasure. You're welcome.